So we've gotten no clear indication from the Harris campaign that she'd break with Biden on the issue of Israel, although a lot of us were holding out hope, perhaps naively so, since, you know, she's been nominally better on this issue, at least rhetorically. But after hearing her DNC speech and specifically what she said about Gaza, then after seeing her interview with Dana Bash and what she said there, explicitly saying she wouldn't condition aid to Israel, even pledging to follow international law at a minimum, which would signal that she would be open to conditioning aid to Israel. You know, needless to say, a lot of us found that really discouraging, to put it mildly. But apparently, there's still reason to be cautiously optimistic, emphasis on the cautious, or as I've previously said, cautiously skeptimistic. And I say this because all of a sudden, conspicuously, anonymous sources close to Harris and her would-be national security advisor, Phil Gordon, have shared some things of interest to the press regarding this particular matter. And what they say is very, very interesting to say the least. So in an article for the Washington Post, journalist Yasmin Abu Talib writes, quote, Gordon worried that the only way to accomplish Israel's goal of destroying Hamas entirely was to destroy Gaza along with it, with all the humanitarian tragedy that would entail, according to a person close to him who spoke on the condition of anonymity to discuss private conversations. Gordon did not believe the United States could influence Influence Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, whom he had dealt with during Israeli-Palestinian peace talks a decade earlier, the person said. So let's pause for a moment to dissect this. An anonymous source close to Kamala's likely national security advisor is saying that he does not agree with the Biden administration's policy on Israel. Full stop. In his experience working with Netanyahu on previous peace talks, he knows firsthand that you cannot move that man. So this is a tacit admission to the press that he's not only aware of the fact that Biden's approach has failed, but he knew that it would fail ahead of time. Now, it would be better if we heard whether or not Harris herself believed this, but Gordon has been working in tandem with Harris on this issue and has a lot of influence. This is her most trusted foreign policy advisor. So for him to have this position and for it to be leaked to the press, that's no small thing. But here's where it gets really interesting. Abu Taleb continues, Harris would probably conduct a full analysis of U.S.-Israel policy to determine what is working and what is not, according to several people familiar with her thinking, with Gordon leading the effort. Okay, It is unclear what would come of that process, but those familiar with conversations between Harris and Gordon say she could be open to imposing conditions on some aid to Israel, a policy that President Joe Biden has largely rejected. Okay, so there's a lot here, but understand that there's so many caveats, right? Because they're saying she could be open to imposing some conditions to aid on Israel. So, you know, they're not giving us a lot to work with. However, they're trying to communicate to us, they're trying to signal to us that she is aware that a policy change is needed. And it's not a lot, but it's still pretty significant, right? It indicates that she would be open to breaking with Biden. So despite what she's saying publicly, privately, those familiar with these conversations that she's having with her most trusted foreign policy advisor suggests that she would be open to conditioning aid to Israel, some aid, and she might be open, but nonetheless, it's on her mind. Now, the caveat is that the person familiar with these conversations that leaked this to the press could be reading too much into this, or they could be lying. This story could be planted in order to placate those of us calling for an arms embargo. Who knows? But for now, it's something to hang on to. But on top of that, there's the potential for a full analysis of U.S.-Israel policy that she would potentially conduct, led by Gordon. So, Again, this is difficult to parse out because it could mean one of many things. You know, uh, first and foremost, it could mean nothing because the Biden administration assessed whether or not Israel was using American weapons in accordance with international law. And when they finally released the report after delaying it, they concluded that they were, which is a laughable thing to say. But nonetheless, they said that because if they stated that, yeah, you know, actually they're they're doing war crimes, they're not using the weapons that we're giving them in accordance with international law, then U.S. law would mandate that Biden cut off the weapons to Israel. So he chose to lie for Israel. So it's possible that this is more of the same. 
but the verbiage here is very interesting to me. So we're not talking about an assessment of Israel's conduct specifically. We're talking about an evaluation of U.S. policy with regard to Israel, period. That's different. So what does that mean? Well, it gives her and Biden the chance to save face if she does go in a completely different direction as president. Because up until this point, she's been towing the line. And she doesn't want to seem like she's flip-flopping or doing a 180. But what this does is it gives her the chance to say, well, you know, after we conducted this comprehensive review, we've determined that we need to go in a different direction. Or she could say we've determined that Israel isn't using our weapons in compliance with international law after seeing new evidence from our review. So it gives her plausible deniability. This is all speculation, of course, but let's just say that you're not going to think that a comprehensive review of U.S.-Israel policy is warranted if you think things are going well. So this is potentially big, but there's more. Despite her public support for Biden's position, her private comments and concerns as the war has unfolded suggest she would be open to challenging Israel more directly, according to people familiar with her views who spoke on the condition of anonymity to discuss private conversations. Okay, so now we're starting to get somewhere. But the question is, what exactly do they mean by she wants to challenge Israel? Because that can basically mean anything. I mean, Biden would argue that he's challenged Netanyahu by telling him how concerned he is again and again and again. It doesn't do anything. So the question is, what exactly do they mean by challenge? And the anonymous sources who leaked this to the press don't actually say. But Ivo Dalder, the former NATO ambassador who's also worked closely with Gordon for decades, he went on the record in this article saying that Gordon would urge her to change U.S. policy. He said that explicitly because Gordon doesn't think the policy is effective. Therefore, he would say, Harris, you should change policy as her national security advisor or foreign policy advisor. As one of her most trusted confidants, he would encourage her to go in a different direction. So Dalder is giving us some additional context and corroborating what the sources close to Gordon are saying about him. Gordon doesn't think that the Biden administration's approach has worked. And this is somebody, again, who Harris trusts the most when it comes to foreign policy. So do with that information what you will. And I say that because, you know, there's a lot of ways to interpret this information. We could assume that Harris doesn't want to publicly break from Biden and wants to hold her cards close to her chest for a reason. You know, her own campaign for whatever reason, chose to leak the story to signal to those of us that care about this issue that not all hope is lost. Or, you know, to put it more cynically, maybe they leaked this story in an attempt to placate voters in Michigan. Either way, this information would not be getting out to us unless the Harris campaign wanted us to hear it. So, again, take from that what you will. Now, on top of that, other high-profile Democrats are publicly speculating about whether or not she would break from Biden on Israel. One of them is Senator Gary Peters. Now, this is what he said at the DNC about Kamala Harris, and this is the senator from Michigan. So, you know, his perspective might be different. Nonetheless, he believes that Harris does not agree with Biden himself. You think it's important for her to show that distinction on her views toward Gaza with President Biden? Yeah, if she has those views, she has to be clear about whatever those views are. She'll have to make. Doesn't she? Yeah. If she make, if she, and I think she has differences, yeah, yeah. and she'll talk about it. Have you, Back to authenticity. Be who you are. Yeah. Be what's in right. your your God. Tell us what what motivates you. What drives you. People wanna wanna see that. Will you convey to her at some point uh, in the next couple of weeks that she ought to do that? Yes. Oh, yeah. if I have a chance to, yeah. Now, again, maybe he's just saying that as the senator from Michigan because he knows her position on this is hurting her. But Ro Khanna spoke to NBC News, and he basically echoed the same sentiment when he was asked about this article from the Washington Post. But he also said something important about Netanyahu at the start that we'll listen to. The hostage families themselves are saying that Netanyahu needs to actually be in the negotiation. Gallant, his own defense minister, has criticized Netanyahu in the cabinet for saying that the Fidelphi Corridor, that Netanyahu is not willing to withdraw troops there as Egypt and the United States want. So I hope there's going to be pressure on Hamas and Netanyahu to end this war, release the hostages. Let me ask you big picture about something. This is according to the Washington Post, which says that Vice President Harris would conduct 
a full review, if elected, of the U.S.-Israel policy and could be open to imposing conditions on some aid to Israel. I know that that's something that you have supported. Have you been pushing her directly to support conditioned aid to Israel? I've been pushing her to support the enforcement of U.S. law. That is what the enforcement of the Leahy law and our security laws require, that we don't have unconditional aid. And, uh, Kristen, this isn't unprecedented. In 1982, after the Sabra and Shatila massacres in Lebanon, President Reagan called up uh, Menachem Begin in Israel and said, we will not give aid uh, in a way that's going to cause humanitarian crises. So we need to have pressure on both sides to end the war, and I'm glad the vice president's open to a new direction. Has she expressed openness, though, to conditioning aid to you directly in some of your conversations? No, I will leave that for the vice president to articulate, but what she has, uh, her team has expressed openness is to a new direction. And look, anyone looking at this policy, you have hostages who still aren't released. You have a war that has lasted almost 11 months. You have over 40,000 people in Gaza dying. We need a new direction of policy to bring the war to an end. Keep in mind, Ro Khanna was a surrogate for Biden's campaign before he dropped out. And he is explicitly calling for a policy change. And he's publicly saying... The same line that Harris's team is saying, or that they're leaking to the press, rather, that she is open to change in policy. Uh, how open she will be, what specifically that means, we don't know. But being open to a break with Biden is important. So they're putting this messaging out there for a reason. She doesn't want to campaign on this, but she wants us to have this information. The campaign wants us to have this information for a reason. But if you zoom out. Part of it is that maybe they're doing this because Democrats have recently been presented with an off-ramp in the aftermath of events that are unfolding in Israel. And I say this because there's been massive protests in Israel after six more hostages died, and a lot of Israelis blame Netanyahu for that since he's refused to accept a deal since his far-right coalition partners like Smotrich and Ben Gavir have threatened to end their coalition if he agrees to a ceasefire. So Netanyahu has prolonged all of this to protect his own political career career and potentially save himself from prosecution. And Israelis aren't ignorant to this fact. They know what he's doing, which is why they're pissed off, which is why they're protesting. Families of hostages called for protests and the largest labor union in Israel called for a general strike and workers even walked off the job until a court ordered the general strike to end on Monday. But I mean, it just goes to show you how serious tensions are getting in Israel because of Netanyahu. And amid the ongoing protests in Israel, Biden admitted that Netanyahu hasn't been doing enough to get a deal. And that's really the understatement of the century because, as Jeremy Scahill explains, quote, Netanyahu has systematically sabotaged a Gaza ceasefire for 10 months and the Biden-Harris administration has appeased and abetted him. Hamas accepted the ceasefire framework with U.S. amendments on July 2nd. Netanyahu then added new conditions, intensified Israeli attacks against Gaza, assassinated Hamas's top negotiator, and launched a bloody assault on the West Bank. The U.S. had the ability to stop this and systematically refused to do so. Instead, it shipped more weapons and continued to defend Israel's war crimes. These are the facts. So Biden saying that Netanyahu isn't doing enough sounds comical when you put it in context. Yeah, no shit, he's not doing enough. He's not doing enough because you're not compelling him to stop bombing children in Gaza, right? But the point is that the entire world has presented Biden with a golden opportunity to abandon Netanyahu. He can now condition aid to Israel or implement a full arms embargo and he has an excuse now. He can say, I am doing this at the behest of the families of hostages who are outraged with Netanyahu. They want Netanyahu to accept a ceasefire, and he hasn't done that. So as president of the United States, I'm going to force him to do it. I'm going to withhold weapons since he has refused to stop what he's doing. But even entertaining the idea of Biden considering this for a second is a fucking joke because he's not going to do that. However, other more savvy Democrats like Ro Khanna and potentially Harris, based on this report, are seeing that this moment necessitates a policy change. The policy that Biden has instituted has been an unequivocal failure. So if you continue to go down this path, you are assuring that you will fail. Unconditionally supporting Netanyahu isn't good for anyone. It's not good for the United States, certainly not good for Gazans and Palestinians in the West Bank as well, and it's not good for Israelis as well. So. This story right here about outrage from Netanyahu, you know, um, that is Democrats getting a ticket 
to get the fuck off of this path, right? And the story from the Washington Post kind of feels like Harris dipping her toes in the water after hearing about how warm it might be. Will this lead to a substantive policy change, though, if she's elected? I don't know. I can't say for sure. But I do feel slightly more cautiously skeptimistic now than I did after hearing her interview with Dana Bash. You can say that that's hopium or copium or that I'm wish casting, but it's undeniably something to hang on to. It's not much, right? But it's a little bit. And I think that's important. I think that a 5% chance of a policy change is better than a 0% chance of a policy change. And I say that because Trump would not change policy. He's not going to listen to what we have to say. This is a man that literally uses Palestinian as a slur. And he just tweeted this disgustingly racist image of Arabs burning an American flag that says, meet your new neighbors if Kamala wins. So, I mean, that's the kind of bullshit we have to look forward to if he wins. But even if it's not possible to move Harris on this issue, and all of this is just a ruse, and the story was planted to placate us, it doesn't matter. Because either way, she'll have to be pushed regardless on this issue and every other issue. And that's true if Trump wins, it's true if she wins. Regardless, we're going to have to fight whoever is in power. That's the reality of American politics, right? And I think it's obvious that Harris is the better adversary, especially in light of this new information. That's the adversary that you want to fight in the White House. As Ole says, we're choosing our weakest opponent. And so, the fact that she's signaling to us that she is open, maybe, possibly, to a policy change, I think that's really important. And yeah, you can do with that information what you will. For a third time, I've said that. But I mean, again, a lot of this is subject to interpretation and speculation. And, you know, we're dealing with limited facts here. So it's conjecture. But needless to say, you know, as somebody who cares deeply about this issue, I think that her campaign leaking this story to the press, probably deliberately, that's important. So I'll leave that there.